Funding for this program is provided by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation and by the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. Additional funding by the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation, Eve and Jerry Young, the Polk Family Fund, and viewers like you, thank you. The Straits of Mackinac, the heart of the Great Lakes. These five interconnected inland seas contain 20% of the world's surface freshwater and 95% of the nation's. Here, twin pipelines stretch four and a half miles across the bottom of the Straits and carry more than 23 million gallons of oil and natural gas liquids every day. Controversial pipelines like Keystone XL and Dakota Access have dominated the news in the U.S., but could Line 5 pose the biggest risk of all? Two of our most precious resources, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, are at risk of one of the worst oil spills that could happen in history if a pipeline called Line 5 were to have a rupture. If not for Beth Wallace, the story of Line 5 might still be quietly hidden beneath the surface. Beth grew up in a small town near Battle Creek, Michigan. She didn't plan on becoming an expert in pipeline safety, but in July of 2010, an environmental disaster changed everything for her. My dad had originally thought that someone was tarring a roof when it happened, and then later found out that there was one of the largest inland oil spills in U.S. history right in our backyard. It was a six-foot gash in a pipeline that completely opened up and spilled over a million gallons into a creek that overflowed into the Kalamazoo River. It wasn't just any oil. It was diluted bitumen, a heavy crude oil mix from Canada's tar sands containing poisonous chemicals like benzene. Residents evacuated the spill zone. Some left homes they would never return to. People, including my mom, they were trying to help with cleaning animals. And then Enbridge threatened suit against people who were cleaning wildlife because it was a liability for them. And so a lot of people were just completely disheartened. It was heartbreaking to see the place you grew up in destroyed. The ruptured pipeline was owned by the Canadian energy giant Enbridge. Where we're at right now is ground zero, Talmadge Creek. I quickly realized that the party at fall, Enbridge, completely mishandled the response to the spill as well as the maintenance to the pipeline. Federal investigators later learned that Enbridge had been aware of cracks in the ruptured line for five years but failed to make repairs. And despite multiple alarms, it took the company 17 hours to shut down the pipeline. Ultimately, the oil was contained in a lake 40 miles downriver from the site of the spill. The effects of the spill would impact the environment and the economy in nearby communities for years. I wanted answers to how this happened, and I wanted solutions so that communities never had to deal with this again. The spill led Beth on a path of discovery that would reveal Line 5 to the world. And so we quickly learned that not only did they have this pipeline, but they have one that's 15 years older that runs through the Straits of Mackinac for four miles. I couldn't believe that anybody would ever consider that a good idea. And I could not believe that the same company that just caused the largest inland oil spill in U.S. history was the company operating them. That's what got me interested in trying to tell more people about it. 
And so that started about a year and a half worth of research to try to just gather as much information as I could. In 2013, Beth co-authored a National Wildlife Federation report called Sunken Hazard. It outlined the history of Line 5 and the risks it posed to the Great Lakes ecosystem, the fishing, boating, and tourist industries, and to the drinking water 40 million people depend on. I wrote Sunken Hazard thinking a couple people might read it. I didn't realize that it would one day turn into a leading environmental issue. We really hit a roadblock in gathering information about the integrity of the pipeline. So we hired a dive crew and decided to get our eyes on it ourselves. What we discovered is almost immediately, we knew that the pipeline had a lot of growth on it and that external inspections by Enbridge would be hard, if not impossible, for most of the pipeline that we saw. But then the pipeline actually follows the contours of the Straits of Mackinac, which goes from around 50 feet below the surface of the water to 200, 250 feet. So the pipeline has huge bends. And when we got into the deeper locations, we started to see the pipeline actually suspend off of the lake bed. Uh, we also saw incredible zebra mussel growth and random piles of debris piled on top of the pipeline. So immediately we had concerns. The report and video created a stir and sparked citizen groups to raise new questions. Were the Great Lakes in imminent danger? Why was Line 5 built in the first place? And with Enbridge's past mistakes, could they be trusted to run Line 5 safely? This is the view from David Gallagher's sunroom. You can see how close Enbridge is working here. I was a journalist for almost 15 years. I covered uh, the Marshall incident, actually, and the cleanup process after uh, 2010. I saw that it was a good company, and it was a company trying to do the right thing. And so uh, when, when an opening came up, I went over to work for Enbridge, and, and I've enjoyed it. Ryan Duffy is the communications strategist for Enbridge. We're North America's largest energy infrastructure company. We know how to do it right. We know how to do it safely. We have the best people here working for this company. Kalamazoo was, was a tragic event, and it was uh, the lowest point in our history as a company. But since that event, we have been transformed. We've changed how we do things and uh, we, we've taken full responsibility for that event. We promised that we would clean that river and restore it to where it was. And, and if you talk to people there, you know, they'll tell you we've done that. We understand people's concerns. We understand their strong feelings about protecting the Straits and the Great Lakes. And, and the thing is, we, we share those concerns. We feel like the best way to protect the Straits and the Great Lakes and at the same time meet energy needs is to operate Line 5 safely and that's, that's what we're going to continue to do. The Line 5 was built in the 50s, but it, it was built actually to protect the Straits. Elected officials back at the time, they wanted a, a way to more safely deliver oil uh, that was safer than doing it by boat, which is how they were doing it at the time. In 1950, a pipeline was built from the booming oil fields of Western Canada to the shores of Lake Superior. From here, oil was to be shipped through the lakes to the refinery city of Sarnia, Ontario. But in the first year of operations, one of the tankers exploded just after unloading oil in Sarnia, killing one person and injuring several. This accident prompted the pipeline builders to make an alternative plan, extending the pipeline all the way through Michigan, including through the Straits. To reduce pressure and increase lifespan, they decided to split the line into two pipes for the underwater crossing. They pulled in some of the best engineering companies at the time, the same engineering companies that built the Mackinac Bridge a few years later. Hundreds of workers and engineers took part in what was called Operation Big Pull in 1953.
engineering history in the making as construction crews race a December 1st deadline to complete the world's longest pipeline, spanning almost 2,000 miles from Alberta oil fields to refineries in Ontario. The final links are pushed through, overcoming enormous natural obstacles. Four miles of 20-inch pipe must be towed across the Straits of Mackinac in northern Michigan, underwater. Pontoons hold the pipe just off the bottom, keeping the waterway free for shipping as the prodigious task goes forward to completion. Chris Shepler's family started a ferry service to and from Mackinac Island in 1945. His livelihood depends on the health of the Great Lakes. Where we're standing right now is basically ground zero if we have the pipeline in our minds. Over my right shoulder right here is Mackinac Island. The bridge is right here. The pipeline is located a couple miles west of the bridge. Look, I, I'm a conservative Republican and, and I don't like people telling me how to run my business. It's not just about ferrying people to a beautiful island. It's about ways of life. It's about life. Water is life. And if we don't have water, not only can we not recreate, but we, we don't have anything to drink. If you had a spill of any kind of magnitude, it wouldn't take very long to move 20, 30, 40 miles. You're looking at a half a day. You're looking at six hours, and, and this thing is, is all over the place. This is the worst possible scenario for an oil spill, as University of Michigan and their scientists have told us. The National Wildlife Federation commissioned the University of Michigan Water Center to conduct a simulation of how the oil would spread from a potential spill in the Straits. We came up with a plan to estimate what impact the currents in the Straits might have on a potential oil spill up there. We came up with the kind of astounding number of 740 miles of shoreline were vulnerable to a potential oil spill. I think a lot of people were shocked that things could move so quickly and such a great distance. The simulation videos went viral and prompted a shockwave of vocal opposition to the pipeline. Enbridge has publicly questioned this simulation. Ryan Duffy says he sees this study as an attempt to sensationalize an issue and scare people living around the Great Lakes. There's a ton of misinformation out there. There's sometimes uh, the belief that we don't do anything to it, that it's been sitting there for 65 years. But, you know, in fact, it's constant. It's constant maintenance and upkeep. In response to the public's growing concern, Michigan Governor Rick Snyder formed the Pipeline Safety Advisory Board to look into the safety of the state's network of pipelines with a special focus on Line 5. The board is made up of members of the general public, government, nonprofits, and businesses. It also gives the people of the Great Lakes a venue to make their voices heard. Now, I drive a car, I heat my home, but this is different because this is a pipeline in the Great Lakes. That body of water is one of the most precious in the world, and the destruction of that water will lead to environmental, economic, emotional, and spiritual disaster. What we wanted to do was show you what the birds will look like, what our fish will look like, what the shoreline will look like. Broken support beams, dents, cracks, corrosions, and at any moment it could rupture and contaminate 20% of the world's fresh surface water. Every step of the way, Ember has continued to say over and over again, trust us, this pipeline is but in brand new condition, it's perfectly fine. And every step of the way, we've discovered that they have not been truthful in their statements. So I believe this pipeline in as good condition as it was the day it was installed. 
our corrosion prevention system is doing its job. When Bechtel designed this system for coating us on this pipeline, the coating system had seven layers. As I understand it, we're down to zero, one, or two now. Dr. Ed Tim, a retired Dow chemical engineer with a PhD in fluid mechanics, has independently studied Line 5 extensively. Enbridge assured us the coating was perfect. I had a suspicions about that statement. And then last year, I got access to some of Enbridge's inspection video. I was able to observe the condition of the coating on the pipe. You can see big gaps. The wrap that's intended to protect it from abrasion has delaminated. Some very long, unsupported spans of the pipe were allowed to develop by Enbridge. So even though the state wrote the easement to let them build this thing and wrote in the requirement that there couldn't be any unsupported spans greater than 75 feet. There's some spans that are four or five times longer than what the state mandated should ever be allowed to develop. The fact that this information was not provided to the Michigan Pipeline Board led me to the belief that Michigan should use its muscle they should just send the state police up there and turn the valves with a little notice. Because of Embridge's lack of transparency about safety issues, people like Larry Bell, who owns Bell's Brewery in Kalamazoo, Michigan, find it difficult to maintain trust. He co-founded a coalition of businesses that opposed Line 5 called the Great Lakes Business Network. Here you've got a company that has lied, they have a terrible track record. Why are we continuing to let them do business here? Of course, we need energy to run our businesses. The thing about Line 5 is it's mostly Canadian oil that goes on for Canadian processing. Our economy, our energy needs in Michigan do not depend upon Line 5. The small amount of energy that we do get from Line 5 is easily replaced and, and brought through other infrastructure into the state, uh, either via rail, truck, or existing pipeline. So why do we, as residents of the state of Michigan, have to take on the liability for something that we don't need? Michigan really does benefit in a lot of ways from the product on Line 5. 30% of the oil on Line 5 goes to Detroit area refineries to be used back in Michigan. And then there's, of course, what all is made from the products from Line 5. Plastics, cell phone cases, water bottles, you know, eyeglasses, car parts, all kinds of things. There is, of course, the propane and going through the winter months, I mean, you can see how just vital that, that is. Enbridge Line 5 is extremely important to the propane industry. It brings a large amount of propane into Michigan and then further east from here. Pipeline transportation of liquids of one form or another is the safest form of transportation in the world. Without, uh, without question, uh, orders of magnitude safer than rail, highway, or any other form of transportation. And there's uh, huge amounts of data that demonstrate that. We estimate that you could be looking at 10,000 uh, rail car loads a year to replace the propane that's attributable to Line 5. Simplicity has shut the thing down. But uh, I also know that, that we have to find the alternative. If we shut it down, what's going to happen? Are there, is there going to be rail cars coming? Is there going to be tankers? Is there going to be tankers on the road? What does that look like? Enbridge has been partnering with many agencies, including the Coast Guard and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, to carry out emergency response exercises to prepare for a potential spill from Line 5 in the Straits. Coast Guard Lieutenant Rachel Wellman and her team would be among the first responders in case of a spill. 
So the exercises are always a way to test our plans and make sure that they're, you know, as, as good as they can be for when game day arrives. Uh, we have a lot of response capability and a lot of trust in our partner agencies. And so I think in the event of an incident, we're, we're well positioned to respond. I don't think it poses as big a risk as everyone thinks. It's not as sensitive to things such as vessels are, collisions, groundings, things like that. It happens every year. I think people need to realize what's driving it. It's supply and demand, right? But we all demand it, and so we kind of have to have it. So we just have to be prepared. I don't think that we will ever have the capabilities to clean it up, ever. Throw another 30 miles an hour of wind on top of it, throw ice flows on top of it, throw all of this covered in ice, trying to clean that up. Enbridge was responsible for an icy oil spill in 1991, when nearly two million gallons of crude oil flowed into a frozen river in Minnesota. This occurred in a relatively contained environment, which is very different from how the powerful and unpredictable currents of the Straits could impact a spill in the Great Lakes. We also need to be very aware of the integrity of the entire pipeline network inland as well, because it comes within miles of our Great Lakes, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron. We decided to map out the, all the spills that Line 5 has had that we could get our hands on through public record. And uh, through that research, we found 29 spills to the previously thought 15 spills. There has never been a release at uh, Line 5 through the Straits. There's never been any kind of incident or any kind of problem there in 65 years. You know, th there have been some releases in other parts of the line, but that is over the course of 65 years. The Pipeline Safety Advisory Board commissioned the Alternative Analysis Report to study the risks of Line 5 and the potential alternatives, including using other existing pipelines. The board planned to use these findings to make recommendations to the governor about Line 5's future. The final report was released in October of 2017. Public input sessions were scheduled for the coming months. But in a surprise move that November, Governor Snyder and Enbridge reached an agreement behind closed doors. They signed a deal with seven new safety actions involving Line 5, which includes studying the potential of a new pipeline inside a tunnel burrowed below the Straits of Mackinac. Governor Snyder signed this deal without consulting with the Pipeline Safety Advisory Board. It gave the impression that the public's voice is meaningless. That is unacceptable for the public to feel that their voice is not being considered by the state of Michigan and the governor. Despite repeated attempts to interview Michigan Governor Rick Snyder, his office was unable to make him available to be interviewed for this documentary. And I'd like to ask this board, how many Native American tribes that you've invited to join into this process? I'm gonna take that, that's a zero. You are directly threatening our way of life, our creation story, seven generations from now, that's gonna be a wasteland, sludge. It'll poison the water supply, kill the fish. There'll be nothing left of this state as the beautiful vacation land. Ask the attorney general, ask the governor, what is the benefit to the state? I sure don't see any. A growing number of citizens and organizations are speaking out about their fears of a spill in the Straits and their love for the Great Lakes. The state of Michigan should engage all of their investigatory and enforcement powers right now to build the case and shut down this pipeline based on ongoing violations of this public trust easement. Many environmental groups are pushing to develop more alternative energy sources like wind and solar to decrease the nation's dependence on petroleum. People are starting to recognize that a clean environment makes perfect sense economically as well as aesthetically, and that everyone benefits, and it's become a nonpartisan issue. Everybody sees 
that this is just good for everyone. It's good for business. It's good for our grandchildren. The final decision on the future of the pipeline rests with Michigan's governor, attorney general, and a host of federal, state, and Canadian agencies. For now, there are no plans to disrupt or shut down Line 5, and it continues to pump 23 million gallons of oil and natural gas liquids every day underneath the Straits of Mackinac in the Great Lakes. Funding for this program is provided by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation and by the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. Additional funding by the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation, Eve and Jerry Young, the Polk Family Fund. And viewers like you, thank you.